Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Leah Smalley. I'm the Student Financial Aid Program's Assistant Director of Financial Aid Services. Uh, we were experiencing technical difficulties, so I'm going to be going through the first few slides just to summarize. Um, I went through the agenda topics, which include program guidelines for loans, legislative changes, I'm going to be discussing the Educational Aid Exemption Program. I'm also going to be discussing the Grant Payments Demo, which was introduced a few months ago, which will be launching in the next few weeks, and then talking about some upcoming events and deadlines. Uh, first, I went through loan program guideline changes. Um, we have now released all program guidelines. Um, we released the loans a few weeks ago, and in those loan guidelines, we have the loan process flowchart a disbursement chart, a change request procedures section, and we have a, a small section on loan debt letter requirements. So um, the loan process flow chart includes three different process flows depending on the loan program. College access loan is initiated by the student, whereas Beyond Time and Texas Armed Services Scholarship Program are initiated by the school. So you'll want to make sure that you look at that when you're going through the guidelines if you have all of those programs at your institution. Um, but this is really intended to help schools and also students understand the flow of the process so that there's that expectation on not only what they need to do, but when they can expect their funds to reach the school. So the top section is from start to finish when they do their application to when this, the, the funds should be received at the school. And then the bottom chart is really intended to show the number of days it will take um, after the waiting period has ended to arrive at the school. So each of these charts is really important so that, um, again, either newer staff or maybe you've been doing financial aid for a lot of, a lot of years, you can understand just how many days something is going to take for you to receive the funding. The next section was added to help schools know how to update loans. We have a lot of loan changes that come through requesting either updates to loan periods, disbursement dates, uh, we have cancellations, reinstatements. There's a lot of reasons why a loan may need to be updated. And so in order to do that, you do have to send through a contact us inquiry, which is located on all of our correspondence, memos, websites, all throughout our guidelines. We try and put it everywhere so that people can contact us easily. So to ensure that they're routed to us correctly, there's certain information that you have to enter onto the form. The first is to make sure that you select that you're an institution. The second is to make sure that you type in where, you're, where you work so that we know exactly who to assign that one to because we have different people dedicated to certain school types. And then lastly, that you select financial aid question regardless of the inquiry. Um, we have people sending in inquiries on eligibility, loan requests, reporting. So no matter what you're sending it for, if you need our help from financial aid services, you do have to select financial aid question. That will help get it here the same day. Otherwise, it could be routed to somewhere else in the coordinating board, and it could take some time to get over to us, which just delays your request. Um, you'll also want to enter, if you're sending a loan request, your Helmnet loan portal ID, and this is uh, important for compliance purposes so that we can route it back or track back who made the request. Um, also the common loan unique ID which is associated with each individual loan. We'll need the student's first name, last name, middle initial, and the last four of their social. And we do ask, and it's on the bottom of the request, do not include all, all of the social security number for FERPA um, compliance reasons. We don't want anything coming through that has all that information. Lastly, to provide a detailed explanation of the changes needed, this helps us understand exactly what you need done. So in this example, we had please update the loan disbursement, which is not quite clear enough. We don't know which loan it is, uh, which disbursement number, and what you're hoping to change it from. So really, the more information, the better, um, or the clearer, the better. So in the second example, we have please update the loan disbursement number one from January 15th to April 1st. So it's a little clearer than the first request. 
Lastly, in the loan guidelines, in each of them, we added this annual student loan debt disclosure. Um, hopefully you're aware of this um, statute that went into effect last session, which requires that institutions provide a letter in electronic format um, informing students of their student debt levels so that they can be better educated about student loan borrowing. Um, we started to get a lot of questions at the coordinating board, which has been housed in a different area of our agency. Financial Aid Services is going to be taking over this uh, piece of the statute and the program rules. So we went ahead and incorporated this into the guidelines to provide some additional clarity and to help guide institutions on how to implement this requirement. You'll notice on this one, it says guidance may change based on le recent legislative activity, which actually leads me into my next section. So we're gonna talk about legislative changes. So the student debt letter, which again went into effect last session, um, generated a lot of questions on what to include in the debt letter. So during this last session that just ended last month, Senate Bill 241 clarified that institutions are not required to provide information regarding loans issued by a private entity under the, under the Texas Education Code 52.335. Um, this is just a clarification. This was always the case with the law but um, people that were interpreting it wanted that extra clarity so that they could make sure that they were following it correctly. So um, we are updating the rules for this legislation. So that will be coming in future months, but it does take some time to revise rules. So until then, if you have questions, please send those through to us and we can provide guidance on um, how to best implement this student debt letter if you haven't been doing it or maybe you need some additional guidance, we can help you. The disabled peace officers and firefighter exemptions. So beginning with fall 2019 semester, the um, House Bill 766 added disabled firefighters as eligible recipients of this exemption. Um, the actual Texas Education Code is 54.352. You won't see the change in that statute um, for quite some time. So we wanted to make y'all aware of this because the exemption is now mandatory for the institutions for both peace officers and firefighters. So you do want to make sure that if this exemption program is handled in another area at your institution, such as your business office, your registrar, or some other area, that you make them aware of this change. Because um, again, it was mandatory before, but now it will be, sorry, it was optional before, it will be mandatory now. So you wanna make them aware. But please note that institutions may not provide exemptions more than 20% of the maximum number of students allowed to be enrolled in a specific course. That's the only caveat, but um, we're kind of a, well, it, it's highly unlikely that you'll reach the 20%, but you do have to monitor that. So please keep that in mind. You may have heard about the electronic TASFA, the Texas Application for State Financial Aid. This has been on a lot of people's wish list for many, many years. And I'm happy to announce that it finally is coming to fruition here through the, the last session. So House Bill 2140 requires that the coordinating board establish an electronic submission portal for the TASFA through the Apply Texas website. Um, this will take some time. You can see that beginning with applications submitted for the 2022-2023 academic year is when this will actually happen. It's going to take time to build and get all the feedback from um, all the, the interested parties. The coordinating board is a, required to have an advisory committee and it's going to consist of financial aid personnel at the institutions, student representatives, because um, we have to make sure that we develop this correctly based on the recommendations that are received from um, the committee and just all the institutions. So more to come on this one, but it did finally happen. So um, in a few years, we will have an electronic TASFA. 
The FAFSA TASFA for high school graduation, you may have heard of, about this and it did pass. Um, House Bill 3 requires that high school students complete or submit a FAFSA or TASFA prior to graduation. Now this will not start until the um, beginning with 12th grade level students during the 2021-2022 school year. So there is some time because they have to work out um, all the different rules and requirements for this legislation. Um, the requirement will be waived if the parent or guardian um, signs a form declining it and school counselors also have the ability to decline based on good cause. So again, a lot of people are, are have all these different questions on how is it going to work. There's going to be a lot of information coming out in the next year or two about this. And it is um, being driven by Texas Education Agency, not the coordinating board. So, but we'll be, we'll be monitoring this closely as well. Finally, the Texas Works Paid Internship, internship Program. Um, we've mentioned this on prior webcasts during Financial Aid Advisory Committee, and of course in the session they talked about this. It's a, through House Bill 3808, it creates a centralized paid internship program here at the Coordinating Board, and it's using existing work study, uh, the Texas College Work Study funding. So this program builds on the governor's tri-agency workforce initiative, and it's to increase the availability of paid internships in the state. Um, the biggest thing that impacts the schools, which should be a, a huge relief to you, is that it removes the current off-campus requirement under um, Texas College Work Study. A lot of schools were reporting that this was difficult to uh, administer and to monitor. So this is something that um, will be repealed in the current code. So we will provide more information as it becomes available. So let's talk about educational aid exemption. Um, this does only apply to public schools, but I do have other information for all schools after this. So I encourage those that are on to hang tight if this doesn't apply to you, but you may learn something in case you ever decide to venture off to a public school. So uh, educational aid exemption allocations went out and um, on the screen you'll see a list of participating institutions. We have those available not only in the announcement that went out, but they're also available on College for All Texans under the Educational Aid Exemption page. Uh, we do, when we have in, uh, students contacting us, we drive them to this list so that they know if the school participates. Uh, we try to make it as available as possible that, so that they know. Um, each school that opted into the program during the, the opt-in, opt-out opt -out period and the allocation process, uh, will receive $12,195. As you can see, that is not a lot of funding. Um, this program does have very, very limited funding, but please note that if you have additional funds, you can choose to supplement the program and add money to the program to fund more students, which I'm gonna talk about in a moment. So oh, the application was released. We posted it on College for All Texans so that students can download that. Um, you're welcome to put that on your own website, print copies and make them available. Um, an educational aid must submit a sem separate application for each term. And the reason that we request that you do that is so that you can confirm their employment and their eligibility. This is a program that requires that the student be um, currently working for the school district for the entire term in which they received the award. So in order to do that, you would need to check it frequently. Um, another thing that we publish every year are two editions of a Frequently Asked Questions. We have an institution edition and we have a student edition. Um, the institution edition is only available on the Student Financial Aid Programs website. It's not that the student can't have it or read it, it's just that it's more geared towards the school. Um, and then the student copy is available on the Educational Aid webpage on um, College for All Texans. So you'll notice at the bottom, I don't know if you can see on my screen, but one has institution in red and the other one says student, I believe in blue. So awarding funds, I kind of mentioned this a minute ago, so let's talk through it a little bit. 
um, if you are participating in educational aid, $12,000 is really just not that much money. The way that this program works because it's an exemption and the way it's written is you do have to exempt all tuition and fees outside of lab and class fees for formula funded courses. And they have to be in a, um, the student has to be in a teacher certification program in a critical shortage area. I will touch on that in a moment. Um, so we've gotten a lot of questions on, so that's not that many students, what do we do? So you have a couple choices. One, you have, um, you have to match at least 10% of a recipient's exemption with institutional funds. So in the example A, if the tuition and fees is $5,400 per term, you have to do at least $540 as 10%. That means that you'll have to use $4,860 out of your award that you were given. So again, um, if you give that in the fall and the spring, that uses up almost your entire allocation. So in example B, you can actually provide the student a greater match out of institutional funds towards educational aid, which would allow you to stretch your money farther. So in this sec second example, um, the tuition and fees is the same amount, but instead of giving 10%, if you give the 40% match, then you would have to pay out of institutional funds the 2160, but that would reduce the amount of your allocation that you have to use, therefore allowing you to pay out more students that are eligible. So again, you're not required to do that. You're only, you have to do at least 10%, but you can choose to do more if you have eligible students. It's really up to the school. If you have specific questions about this, um, I would recommend sending it through contact us so we can set up a time to talk about it. Cause I know that uh, especially if you haven't participated in educational aid in a while, it's good to go through it one-on-one. -on -one. So let's talk about the shortage areas. Um, each year in the guidelines, we publish the shortage areas that the student has to be in in order to receive this. Critical shortage areas are um, reported actually by the Department of Education, and they collect that information from Texas Education Agency. So both agencies are, or, or departments are gonna be working to publish this, but they haven't released it yet. So I was gonna walk y'all through how to look it up. Um, we will be sending those out once they're available, but if you wanna keep an eye on it, I wanted to make sure that people know where to find that information. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull that up right now. So um, within that link on my screen, when you click on the Department of Ed, it's going to pull up a page that looks like this. It actually is on the home screen here. So to find the teacher shortage areas, you're gonna to go to view report, and then eventually it's gonna say 1920 here, but just for demonstration purposes, I'm gonna do 1819, and then I'm gonna select Texas. And then I'm just gonna do all and hit submit. When I scroll down, you'll see that all of these here are the shortage areas that are within the 1819 guidelines. This helps you see this is what the student has to be getting their teacher certification in in order to receive educational aid. They have to be English as a second language, bilingual education, career and technical education, special education, and math. So if they're not in one of these teacher cert programs in one of these areas, they would not qualify. So again, we do plan to release the shortage areas once they're available. And also Texas Education Agency, they will post them on their website as well. You can always just type in um, shortage and then it queries the site and you can see here's the 1819 shortage areas. And then once it pulls it up, they have the same areas as the Department of Education. So um, again, we will send those out once they're available, but they haven't released them yet. Okay, back to this presentation. Some educational aid reminders. Um, I mentioned this earlier that the student has to be employed in some capacity by a school district. That could mean that as long as they're working full time for the full term, they can receive the award as long as they meet all the other eligibility requirements. Um, those include things such as 
being registered for selective service. They have to be a Texas resident. They have to have been an educational aide for one year in the past five years. So there's um, definitely other pieces of this program that you need to be familiar with. So again, if you go to the guidelines, you can read through all the eligibility requirements and all the different steps necessary for this. Um, exemption for student teaching. This one has always thrown people off a little bit uh, because I think there's just questions on how to decipher on, on whether the student has to do student teaching or not. If the student has a bachelor's degree and then receives their Ed Aid Award for the first time, they still have to do their student teaching. If they receive their Ed Aid Award prior to getting their bachelor's, so they're getting their bachelor's and their teacher certification at the same time, they're not required to do the teacher certification. Um, some schools have asked, do we have to honor this? And the, the answer is yes. Um, it is required that you waive student teaching for this population of students. Um, so it is written that way in the law and in the rule. So if you have specific questions for your institution, um, just please reach out and we can walk through it together. Okay, so lastly, how do you get your money, especially if you haven't participated in a long time? Um, ed educational aid is not just released out, you have to request it. In order to do that, you have to go on to student financial aid programs under program resources, and then under the educational aid exemption page, there is a funds request form, which looks like this right here. Once you fill it out and you submit it, we receive it on our end. We process that here at the coordinating board and they will send out the money through the comptroller. Um, you do need to make sure that you have your, your um, account set up correctly. So when we send you the money, you know that there's state funds coming to you. Otherwise, it could get mixed up with your other funding coming through. So please note that if you have not had this set up pre previously. Another thing online with this form is an instruction sheet. So this does walk you through step by step on how to complete it. Um, it's very helpful if you've never submitted one before. So that is educational aid exemption. Um, I know again, maybe additional questions we can either set up conference calls with schools if you if you want to do it that way you can send a contact us through us uh, with specific questions and we can submit those back to you in writing so let's talk about the grant online payment enhancements uh, a flyer was sent out a few months ago and then i brought this up on a prior webcast to notify schools that uh, we are creating a new way to request money. Um, it's going to be overall the same concept, but there are some new benefits and some changes that you'll wanna be aware of. Uh, this is my disclaimer up front that we will be doing more training, that what I'm about to demo for you is a test site, so it will not necessarily look the same once it goes live because we're doing changes even as we speak today. So this is just intended to be a sneak peek so you can get a feel for what it's gonna be looking like. And then once we have all the final changes done, we're going to have an instruction manual and additional training available for the schools. So again, this is just more of a, a fun thing to show you what to expect. And we have done a few of these on other platforms um, such as the Financial Aid Advisory Committee that was hosted in June. So you can also watch that one as well. So I'm gonna pull up the site and we're gonna walk through it together. So um, the goal right now is when you log into your CB Pass account, it's already gonna be set up. That's the intention as of today. Um, if that changes, we'll let you know. And as you can see, it's loading. So give me just a moment as that pulls up. I'll close some of my browsers. Okay. So um, this is what the new funds request and return of funds process is going to look like. When you first log in, at the top of the screen, you're gonna have a menu bar at the top and it has four different links at the top. So I'm gonna be going through each one of those one by one. 
Um, at the top of the screen, you're going to see your appropriation year, which is the fiscal year. And this drives how you request and you return money. So it's important that you actually you're aware of this so that you're not requesting or returning money under the wrong year. This screen is a high level summary of how your allocation is being spent. So you're going to have your total allocation that was sent out um, a few weeks ago. And then anything that you request is going to show up as, a, excuse me, whatever is available from your allocation is going to be left over here. And then the student count that you have submitted to us will be tracked here. Um, this again is a summary of the payments that we have sent you and the returns that you have sent back. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of quick uh, transactions so that we can go through them together. And the first one I'm going to do is a, a requesting fund. So if you're, I'm going to use Texas Grant because um, that's what this test site is set up to do. So when you go to the request funds section, again, like I mentioned, this will default to 2019 and the program type that you're approved to request funds for. You're going to have your total allocation and the available allocation, which you saw on the main screen. If you want to request an amount, you'll put that here. So I'm going to do $50,000. And you can put the students that you're requesting them for. So I'm going to do 20 students. Um, once you hit submit, it's going to pop up here saying it's been submitted successfully. And I'm going to show you where you can look at that transaction in just a moment. Now let's just let's just say that you want to request more funding, but you actually don't have any new students. You can enter just an amount here, or you can update your student count here. You can do both one or the other. It's kind of up to you. Because grant funding can be moved from student to student, um, you can make those changes through these screens without having to do both. So I'm also going to do a return real quick. So let's just say it's ending the, the quarter and you, don't, you have some leftover funding you need to send back to us. Uh, I'm going to send back $2,000. And as of today, when you're updating the student count, you have to do a negative number, but we are changing that so that it can just be a whole number. So I'm going to do negative eight and you do have to provide a comment. I'm going to do ineligible, if I can type. Oh. <laughs> I'm kind of typing backwards here. And then you'll hit submit and it says it has been submitted successfully. So um, one of the biggest benefits of this new portal is you're going to be able to see um, real time when you submit these things. So when you go back to your home screen, all of this got updated. You'll notice that this student count went up, the available allocation went down, I'm almost out of money. <laughs> um, but another really helpful thing is your transaction details screen. When you click on the transaction details, um, you do need to update the year that you're going to be looking at. And of course, it'll default to the program that you have access for. And then it's going to have a list of statuses. Um, each of these statuses, it's kind of important to know what they mean so that you know where the funding is at in the process. So the waiting, I'm going to actually go out of order because I want to make sure that the flow makes sense. The first one is requested. That's when you submit your request for funding. Um, you're going to see that on the list when it pulls up. Once um, you request it and it goes into our approval process, it's going to flip to waiting for approval. That means that the coordinating board is reviewing it and it's getting pushed through the system for payment. Um, once it actually goes through and pays to your institution and we receive something from the comptroller saying that it's been paid, it will flip to dispersed. Once you send us a return, it's going to flip to coordinating board waiting for funds because that means that you've initiated a refund with us. And once we physically receive those funds in our account, it will flip to returned. And lastly in the list is canceled. That means that you submitted something in error and you have to send us a request and we will physically cancel that transaction and you'll resubmit the, the revised one. So 
I'm going to walk through and show you what this is going to look like if we just default it to all statuses and then I'll do one where we can filter it. So let me run this for you and you'll see in here that it, there's a long list of transactions because we've been testing this um, and the transaction ID here shows the type of status so this was a return here's the year here's the school code the date and the transaction number so this is the seventh return that's been done for 2019 and this is indicating that the coordinating board is waiting for those funds that means you submitted it but we have not received this two thousand dollars yet and this is for eight students okay so that's how that works here's another example this is a request um, the money's been requested for fifty thousand dollars for twenty students and, and so on and so forth you can see how it goes down but if you want to just filter it you say hey I really just want to see how many requests we've made this year it's going to filter it you can see again in order here's transaction one through eight it does go newest to oldest and has all the student count in there so this is just much more helpful than the PDF copy you're currently receiving which gets emailed out to you um, you will receive notifications based on the user that's logged into the CB Pass system. So um, those will go out once you submit this. So you'll, you will still get something. It's just that this makes it more um, easily trackable. So you can log in at any point and see that. And uh, anyone who has access for your institution will be able to see these transaction details. Uh, let's see if there's any other reminders um, one thing to note even though I'm working in 2019 here this is the test site meaning that these are 1819 funds this is not available for 1819 so anything that you're returning um, for 1819 will still go through the current process starting with 2020 everything will go through this portal all requests and all refunds are all tied into one place but you have to remember, um, especially when you're doing things like your FADS reconciliation, if you're working with 1819 money, you still have to use the old process with the old forms. So that is, I think, all I wanted to go through on this. My disclaimer, again, <laughs> this is test. We will be making changes. Um, once it's available, we will send out a notification and so you can start using the system to request your 1920 money. Okay, I'm going back to my PowerPoint. Okay, so we did our demo. Um, I put any questions here. I'm going to push through. If you can start writing your questions about any of the topics I've discussed so far, um, I'm going to circle back, but I'm going to go through my updates um, so that we can collect those questions and then we'll circle back. So general updates and important dates. Uh, as of this morning, all allocations have been released. We released the uh, tuition equalization grant to EG this morning. Um, so everything should be out. We will have the final one posted to our website, but all of the notifications have been posted on SFAP um, except for TEG, which again, that will be get, get done this week. Another thing that was released today was the TEG engagement guide. We did receive a lot of feedback that um, the schools needed it earlier, so we uh, got that out the door so everyone can download that off of our website and it's also in the notification that went out this morning. Um, the grant payment training coming soon. We're working on the instruction manual for the process I just demoed for you. Once that's available, we'll send it out. Uh, we, we do plan to do this again on the next webcast so that you can see what, it, what the real live version looks like and any enhancements or changes we've made since this walkthrough. Um, so more to come on that. And then lastly, the 2021 TASFA. Uh, we got feedback from the institutions as well as the, we had a TASFA subcommittee that was created as part of our financial aid advisory committee group. Um, and they were charged with looking at the application and making some changes or recommendations to improve the overall TASFA process. 
And one of the changes that they requested, or requests I should say, was can we get the TASPA a little bit earlier so that we have time to get it updated and onto our website um, and get it over to our vendor if per if you have a vendor that works with you um, on an online TASPA of any sort. And so we are starting the process now so we can release it to the schools earlier. We will not be releasing it to the students before October 1st, but we wanted to make sure administratively wise y'all could get it out um, and do what you needed to do if you need to brand it or, or make changes in any way. So that is coming soon. The important dates to remember, August 1st. So that's coming up in a few weeks. We wanted to let people know that um, if you have any 1819 money that you have not requested, you do have to do that by August 1st to make sure that we can get it out to you and posted before the end of the fiscal year. Um, so that does include all three grant programs, educational aid and bilingual education. And as a reminder, if you participated in the authority to transfer where you moved your work study money into your grant program, um, you do have to request those funds. So if you moved the money, please send us the funds request form by August 1st so that we can get those through. Authority to transfer requests have, have passed. You can no longer do that, but the schools that did move money have to request it. Another reminder is that beginning August 1st, you will be able to start requesting your 1920 funds. Um, we do want to start getting those through so that once the new fiscal year starts on September 1st, we can start processing those um, payments out to you. So you can start doing that for 1920 and that will be through the new portal. August 13th is the next webcast. Uh, we'll be sending out the flyer with the topics. If you have any recommendations or ideas or requests, um, at the end of my presentation, I have a survey you can fill out and you can send through ideas or anything on your wish list that you want me to go through and I can hopefully incorporate that into next month's webcast. And then finally, August 19th, that's the day that the validation deadline for cycle two for FADS is going to hit. So um, if you haven't started, <laughs> you may want to start submitting your files. If you are in the process and you need assistance, please reach out to us. Make sure you send any requests through our um, FADB email address, which is located also in the user manual instruction guide. Um, and like I said, we're here to help you get through so you can validate on time. And I think that's it. Financial aid services phone line. We're here Monday through Friday, eight to five. Our number is 844-792-2640. Um, we are here to answer your questions, so please call us. And then lastly, my information. You can um, email me if you have specific questions regarding this webcast. You can also send it through Contact Us. That ensures that someone can get to you more quickly in the event I'm out. Um, my webcast survey is there, again, to give me overall feedback on how I'm doing, any topics you want to see, just any anything good or bad, and then both of our phone lines. So I am going to stop and circle back to the questions. We have about 13 minutes left in the hour. If we can get through them faster, we will. Um, but I'm gonna go back here and let's see. I only see one question, Cynthia Butler. Will the advisory committee be specific to the electronic application? Um, and I think you're referencing the slide where I talked about a committee will be created for the electronic TASPA. And the, the answer is yes, a specific committee will be created. I don't know who does that, if it has to be something that you apply to, but I do know that if it's something that requires institutions to apply, we will send that out. So more information will come out. Rhonda, just to clarify, it says the Texas College work study off campus requirement is no longer in effect for 1920. It has just been updated in the, it just hasn't been updated in the guidelines yet. I will provide clarity on that. It may not actually go into effect until next year, but I don't want to misguide anyone. So I will get the answer to that. And then we will, if the guidelines have to be updated, they will be. 
Um, and I can also do an update on next month's webcast. So stay tuned on that. But it's in written in the, the bill and once it was signed, when it goes into effect. Um, and since it was written into, uh, there was multiple layers for that bill, I just don't want to misinform anyone. Giselle Martinez says, is CB Pass being updated with FY19 eligibility information as FAD files are validated? I notice a student has their FY19 eligibility posted on CB Pass already. So as schools validate, the award history is getting updated. Is that what you're asking? The award history database where you're checking? Yes. So yes, as schools validate, that database does get updated, but it won't do that until schools physically do the validation. It's not every time the file is submitted. Did that help answer your question? And, OK. And if you validated from cycle one, that should be the information you're seeing for that student as well. So every time you validate or certify, it's going to update. Okay, I don't see any other questions. Anything out there, anyone? I'm going to make sure I answer any other questions that I can answer got 10 minutes to spare, but I will not keep you if we don't need to. Okay, Sandy, when will, be, when will we be discussing TEOG? Do you mean the program in general or something specific to TEOG? Can you clarify what you're looking for? Just general. Um, we can set up a one-on-one -on -one training with your institution if you'd like. Um, if there's something that comes out that changes program rules, that's when I'll typically pull it onto a webcast because it'll impact all the institutions. Um, but I'm happy to see if we can set something up for your school if you'd like. Just, you can send me an email. Perfect. Okay, anyone else? Going once, going twice. I see no typing. Oh, one more question. Is cycle two information up? This student also had their SAP determined or does SAP still need to be updated? I think what we should do, Giselle, just to make sure I'm answering all your FADS questions correctly is we can set up a call one-on-one -on -one to go through it. That way I'm answering it because I have some follow-up questions <laughs> and I don't want to hold everybody on a call and go through that. Does that sound good? Perfect. Okay, everybody. Well, I appreciate y'all joining. Um, again, feel free to contact us. Use my survey link and I will talk to y'all next month. I appreciate all the time y'all spend with me and I hope this was useful. Have a great day. Talk to you soon.